graduate school 20 years ago, I was looking for a research project. I knew I wanted to study animal diseases, but I didn't know where to start. A professor in my department had recently lost an entire captive colony of monarch butterflies to a mysterious disease. And one day, she dropped a pile of dead monarchs on my desk and said, Sonia, you like studying diseases. Maybe you should study this one. So I did, and I still am. This one chance event changed my life. I fell in love with monarchs and their amazing migration, and I've been studying them ever since. And even though I watch monarchs day in and day out, to me, their story never gets old. And I want to tell you that story today, about their migration, why it's unraveling, what we can do about it, and why we should care. Monarchs start out their lives as tiny eggs on plants, in fields, roadsides, and gardens all across the United States and Canada. And they grow up into big caterpillars that feed almost exclusively on milkweeds. And there's over 100 milkweed species across North America. Monarchs undergo several breeding generations during the summer months, and each generation takes about a month. At the end of the summer, the butterflies emerge ready to migrate. Each fall in eastern North America, monarchs undertake an epic migration, flying all the way south to wintering sites in central Mexico. These tiny insects weigh half a gram and travel across an entire continent, thousands of kilometers in a matter of weeks. It's an incredible journey. Monarchs travel to high-altitude fir forests in the volcanic mountains of central Mexico. Millions upon millions of butterflies cluster together in these forests. And scientists know how monarchs navigate towards Mexico, but how they find the same patches of forest when they themselves have never been there before is still a mystery. When viewed from above, the evergreen trees appear to be shaded orange, almost like autumn leaves because they're draped with the wings of so many butterflies. To witness one of these colonies in person is a life-changing experience. In the cool mornings, the butterflies group together tightly, hanging in clusters two to three layers thick from the trees. And on warm afternoons, the clusters explode like fireworks, showering orange confetti into the sky. It's magical. I'll never forget the first time I saw it myself. And on that trip, I was working in the middle of a colony with maybe 100 million monarchs. And I was really frustrated because I had to stare at my notebook all day recording data when I really just wanted to look around me and stare at the butterflies streaming through the forest. In March, the same monarchs that fly south to Mexico leave the forest and fly north in the spring to recolonize their breeding range. Now, this migration of monarchs is one of the Earth's last great migrations. These butterflies fly the longest distance two-way migration of any insect species in the world. But around the world, a lot of these great migrations, the Pacific salmon, sea turtles, whooping cranes, have disappeared or are disappearing due to things that we, as people, are doing to them and their habitats. Their losses change the entire ecology of ecosystems, and they're impossible to replace. Like these other migrations, monarch migration is declining too. In fact, the last three consecutive years have been the lowest numbers of monarchs ever recorded in Mexico. So low, in fact, that scientists estimate that migratory monarchs have declined by 90%. So if monarchs were people, this would be like losing every person living in the United States, except for those in Ohio and Florida. Now, what are the causes of this monarch decline? Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of different challenges facing monarchs, ranging from climate change and drought to deforestation and illegal logging in Mexico, 
that disease I mentioned earlier causes problems for them, even road strikes or car strikes along roads during the fall migration. One monarch biologist I know refers to this as the tragedy of a problem with many causes. Because there are so many problems facing monarchs, it's easy for people to point their fingers at other causes rather than to take positive action. One of the more ominous threats to monarchs has been the loss of milkweed plants in agricultural habitats due to shifting agricultural practices. So it might surprise you to hear that what we eat affects food that's available to the monarchs. But here's how it works. In Mexico, around half of the monarchs at their overwintering sanctuaries originated from a part of the United States called the Corn Belt that includes Illinois, Iowa, and Indiana. And this makes sense when we realize that the most common food plants, the most common milkweeds used by monarchs are agricultural weeds that grow in and around crop fields. Now, the growing demand for corn, driven by ethanol-based fuels, combined with the proliferation of crops, especially corn and soybeans, that are genetically engineered to tolerate herbicides, has caused the widespread loss of milkweed in a lot of these agricultural landscapes. So in the past, farmers used to spray their fields with herbicides once in the spring before the crops sprouted, leaving milkweed and other weeds to grow later in the summer. But now, with these herbicide-tolerant crops, they can be sprayed repeatedly all summer long without hurting the crops. But the milkweeds are a different story. Within a week of being sprayed with herbicides, the milkweed plants turn yellow, and eventually they shrivel and turn brown and die, taking out any monarch caterpillars with them. Once the milkweeds are gone, they don't come back. And when the milkweeds are gone, so are the monarchs. The deployment of herbicide-tolerant crops has increased very quickly in this country. In 1994, there were virtually no herbicide-tolerant crops planted here in the U.S. Now, almost nine out of every 10 acres of corn and soybean are planted to genetically modified herbicide-tolerant varieties. So this has been a huge and rapid increase. Monarch numbers over this same time period, overwintering in Mexico, have bounced up and down, but generally experienced a downward trend, almost mirroring the shifting agricultural practice. So it could be that the monarchs that were once produced in these agricultural landscapes are now gone. And this is a bigger problem. It's not just affecting monarchs and milkweed, but bees, birds, other pollinators, other plants and animals. We're not looking as closely at these other species as we're looking at monarchs. So monarchs might be the canary in the coal mine, telling us that something is wrong with their habitats. This decline of monarchs, scientists worried. So worried, in fact, that eight months ago, a petition was filed with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to ask that monarchs be federally protected under the Endangered Species Act. And the petition was found to have merit, and now it's undergoing a longer-term review. And it's, it's just shocking that one of the most common butterflies in North America now has an uncertain future. Other people are worried about monarchs, too. For many people, they have an emotional or a spiritual connection to these butterflies. Children in the U.S. and Canada grow up learning about monarchs from an early age. They rear them in their homes, in their classrooms, to learn about biology and life. There's over a dozen children's books written about monarchs. They've inspired art, films, fashion, literary novels. Monarchs are the official insect of seven U.S. states. And in Mexico, the return of the monarchs to their forests each fall coincides with an annual event called Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead. And this event often intertwines images of the butterflies with images of the dead. According to some traditional beliefs, the monarchs returning to their winter sanctuaries symbolizes the souls of lost ancestors coming back to Earth for an annual visit. 
Migratory monarchs aren't just strong and beautiful, they're also genetically unique. A study published last year looked at the genetic blueprints of monarchs from over a dozen locations around the world and found that migratory monarchs in North America have unique genes and traits that let them fly long distances more efficiently. So what this means is that if we lose the migration, here in North America, we cannot bring it back by simply bringing in monarchs from other places because those traits that let them fly such long distances will have been permanently lost. Now, this all sounds like terrible news, and you're probably thinking, are there any bright sides for monarchs? And what can we do to create a future where their migration survives? Well, monarchs are resilient little insects. They've bounced back before from tough times, and they can do it again if we give them a chance. It might seem like an overwhelming task, but there are small things that each of us can do that collectively can make a big difference. One of these things is to think about the food that we eat and how it's grown. And to make choices as consumers at the grocery store, the food market, to buy foods that are grown in a way that makes room for monarchs and other species. So we can buy organic foods, especially corn and soy. Now, when we buy processed foods here in the US, we can't look at the label and see whether or not there's ingredients from herbicide-tolerant crops. But there are several mobile apps that shoppers can get that allow you to scan the barcode on a food item and see whether or not there are genetically modified ingredients. So I think, or I hope, we can use some of our purchasing power as consumers to boost the demand for foods that are grown in a more sustainable way. A second important step is to participate in what's called citizen science projects, where members of the public are sort of the eyes on the ground for scientists telling us when and where you see monarchs and what they're doing. There are several citizen science projects that focus on monarchs. One of my favorite is a project called Journey North, where volunteers report online the location and date of the first monarch that they see every spring. And this allows scientists to track the monarch migration north from Mexico up into Canada. Most of these programs are free to participate in. So you can start seeing monarchs and tell scientists when you see them and what they're doing so we can put together a better picture of what habitats monarchs need and what they're doing and how that's changing over time. A third crucial step is habitat restoration for monarchs. And this can happen on a big scale when milkweeds and nectar plants are included in roadside plantings or in prairie restorations. And it can also happen on a small scale when we create a home for monarchs next to our homes in the form of butterfly gardens. Now, most of the time, we are trying to get rid of insects from our house and garden, and we surround our homes with concrete and some lawn that's carefully manicured and chemically treated. But what if instead we started to see the importance of insects in our own lives and we set a table for them in our own backyards in the form of nectar plants for the butterflies to feed on and locally sourced native milkweeds for the caterpillars to munch on? It might not seem like a big deal, but if just one in out of every 10 people here in the US planted a butterfly garden and put just one milkweed plant in, that would be 30 million more milkweeds to help boost monarch populations. And this is something that everyone, that all of us can do. It might not seem like losing one tiny insect is a big deal. After all, we walk past insects every day without really seeing them. But I have seen the orange and black wings of a million monarchs gliding through the skies. And I want all of us and our children to be able to witness that magic, too. The monarchs are sending us a signal that something is wrong, and they're worth paying attention to. We can save their migration if we act now. 
For so many of us, monarchs are a connection to nature that began when we were children. And our actions now will let future generations make that same connection. Thank you.